I don't think I elaborated too much on, well, first of all, I hadn't tried it long enough to give you a definitive statement, but after trying it, What's up guys, Derek, moreplatesmoredates.com. Today we're gonna to be talking about oral castor oil. So everyone's been asking me to, well not everyone, people who are interested, people who are interested in hair loss stuff have been asking me about updates on the castor oil. And I've answered so many comments now that I'm just, you know, I'm, I've seen enough that it has justified literally prioritizing this update video over like 30 other videos I had. I had in a list of stuff to do. So in terms of what I think about it after trying it myself, first of all, digestive issues, I've had none so far and I've gone as high as 1.5 to two milliliters per day. I kind of like, you know, jump back and forth sometimes. I'm probably gonna stick with one long-term just cause I'm a little bit cautious about the uh, effects on the digestive system. But with that being said, I've tolerated a, at least one milliliter now for over almost two months straight, maybe, I don't know, maybe like one and a half. I don't remember when I first started it, but anyway, I haven't had any issues and you know, some people have had to completely discontinue their use because of the digestive stress they experienced. Um, this isn't super common, but you know, some people I have heard they had to do that. I've had a handful of individuals come out and message me since I posted the first video as well about their, uh, good experiences with it, which was interesting because I wasn't expecting very many people to actually go along with this. I thought they were just going to watch my progress and see if my stomach gets fucked up or not pretty much. But some people have gone out of their way and done this too. And one glowing review in particular, this guy, I'm not going to say his name, obviously keep him anonymous here, but he emailed me title of the of the email castor oil says hi Derek thanks for your amazing content I'm at the end of my first very long cycle five months 500 milligrams per week of test adding SARMs for the last couple of months my hair was getting raped it had <laughs> it had lost all volume on top and was totally flat apart from the bushy sides I have been taking two to three milliliters per day of castor oil for nearly two weeks now my hair is getting thicker and it is taller on the top of my head then the sides once again, I have also tried two topical applications after my last microderm pen treatment. My hair is looking thick, thick enough to stand up and support itself. This is crazy. I have also been using that fancy ketoconazole shampoo daily, but it, that didn't have any effect. I have bought finasteride, but my hair started shedding hard. So I discontinued after one pill. Minoxidil fucked up my face causing dry. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't laugh. Minoxidil is pretty rough though for some people, unfortunately. Which is interesting because it's like the, you know, very highly recommended as like the number one go-to thing. I literally link it in my video descriptions too because it is, you know, one of the only FDA treated uh, approved things that works. But it doesn't mean it's side effect free. There's a reason I don't use it myself. Um, bloats me up with water. For some people it seems to, you know, give them some uh, issues with, I don't know if it's related to collagen specifically, but some people do notice uh you know, an effect cosmetically on their skin, on their face. So that's something definitely to note as well before you just jump into it haphazardly. And that's why I make so many videos of Minoxidil talking about why it's not necessarily something you want to just like go gung ho into. So it does work very well, but for some people, you know, the side effects are, you know, very real. They can be. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have no issues, but there are a lot of individuals, individuals that do have issues too. And that's uh, to, very notable. So Minoxidil fucked up my face causing dry patches. This castor oil seems to be totally counteracting this is the testosterone I am still taking. Hopefully the bald patches above my temples with virtually no hair will repopulate over time. Thanks for motivating me to get back on the pickup too. Thank you so much for helping me. So obviously this guy's having really good results and I thought it was worth you know throwing into the video here because it hasn't been that long since I posted the video and there's already people getting results with it, which is interesting. As far as myself, I do think it has impacted my growth rate to a notable extent. Like I definitely have to get shaved more often, more frequently. I think my hair might be getting darker. I don't know, but it's definitely growing quicker, I believe. And I think some of offsetting, you know, the cosmetic look of hair loss, especially if you're diffuse thinner is literally the rate of loss relative to the rate of your antigen phase, essentially. So I've discussed this in the past, how if you're fighting like an upstream battle with growth agonists, where you're basically, 
you have a very high rate of loss, but then your rate of growth is poor. You're fighting an uphill battle, and the ideal scenario would be to like get your loss to zero and then like get your regrowth going. Because you know, otherwise, you're basically like in a canoe trying to like row up a stream against the current. Is basically how I, you know, my like I don't know metaphor for it or analogy or whatever it's called. But uh, yeah, as far as like growth agonists that seem to work, I think oral castor oil may be one of the top options right now. Obviously, I'm not recommending it. It's kind of like an odd off-label use of it. But um, I'm assuming it's legal. Like, it's you can't market it for oral use. But, I mean, it is recommended by, like, physicians and stuff for constipation as well as inducing labor. So, obviously, this stuff is used orally, like, fairly frequently. It's not for hair loss and micro doses. But as far as, like, the safety profile, I didn't really delve into that as much as I should have in the first video. But in my article, I actually recently updated it and I went a bit deeper into this and basically because obviously we don't know the long-term ramif potential ramifications of um, or tolerability of minoxidil or sorry of castor oil but so data outlining its tolerability tolerability as a laxative shed light on its safety in the short term but in the long term it's kind of ambiguous however according to the food and agricultural organization and world health organization up to 0.7 milligrams per kilogram of castor oil per day is safe for men. Oral castor oil is also generally recognized as safe and effective for use as a stimulant laxative by the FDA. So it's, uh, you know, grass status generally recognized as safe. And we're not using very much. I'm not using very much. I'm using one milliliter per day on average. Um, you know, sometimes I get closer to two just because I decide, you know what, I'm going to crank it up today. And then I kind of like think, oh, maybe I just need one and then I go back to one. But it seems to be like one of the most tolerated as far as, oh, one thing I should note too, not just as far as like relative to minoxidil, it seems like the side effect profile is a lot better. You know, I'm not going to say it's a better, I feel like minoxidil is probably a better growth agonist than castor oil at the end of the day. Um, however, I think castor oil is probably in the same ballpark. Usually when we're talking about minoxidil compared to other things that help growth rate, the only other thing I can think of off the top of my head that's formidable is something like MK677 or, or like literally injecting growth hormone. But it's like, is that really a long-term sustainable practice just for hair density? Like probably not. Like you don't really want to put yourself in a state of potential, you know, compromise blood glucose control just so you can get a better growth rate on top like ideally you want something that just gives you a more favorable balance of pge2 to pgd2 or just better circulation with a lack of side effects and it seems like castor oil is probably a better bet as far as like something to introduce then you know that's that's not for me to say anyways i'm just going to comment on my experience and what other guys have said to me it seems like other people are having you know, fairly good outcomes with high levels of tolerability. One of my friends did actually discontinue because he thought that his uh, shit quality had gone to shit. <laughs> like literally the quality of his shits had gone to shit. And so that, you know, the quality of his shit sucked after taking it. However, he was using up to five milliliters per day. And in addition to that, his diet isn't like 100% on point. So there's factors interfering that, you know, potentially could impact the end result of his poo quality so for me there's been no difference so far but i'm only using one milliliter but it's like do you really need more than that i don't know i think it's good based on you know i'm keeping it in my protocol at least as far as what is my current protocol it's changing all the time so don't ask because i'm gonna end up making another video about something else like in a week and then you're gonna be like well what are you doing now and it's like once i've tried everything I'm going to make like a comprehensive guide or some sort of thing that kind of like ties it all together. Let's you guys know what I think is good, what my current protocol is that I'm actually going to continue with long term, what, you know, I think has the lowest risk profile with the greatest outcomes kind of thing. But in addition, something to touch on regarding the castor oil too is the reason it works is the ricinoleic acid that increases PGE2 in the body as discussed in the first video. However, I don't think I elaborated too much on, well, first of all, I hadn't tried it long enough to give you a definitive statement, but after trying it, I haven't made a video on microneedling plus PGE2, but this is something I've experimented with in the past and I probably should do a dedicated video, but in theory with this prostaglandin ratio thing, you would think, you know what, just take like literal PGE2 powder and apply it to your scalp 
topically with, you know, a sufficient vehicle for delivery. And, uh, you know, you can get the optimal balance by literally like shoving PG2 into your scalp, which, you know, in theory doesn't sound like a bad plan. So I did try this. I literally micro needled and would apply a shit ton of PGE2 after and it would actually, it turned my scalp really red and it was really interesting to see the response it had to it. And the thing is, is first of all, PGE2 is very cost prohibitive. In addition to that, it uh, like for long-term use, if you're going to compare the cost of castor oil to PGE2, castor oil is like one one hundredth of the price, if not less, maybe like one one thousandth of the price to be honest. But in addition to that, the literal PGE2 powder applied to my scalp, even when I micro needle to increase absorption, I got better results from the castor oil than I did from literal straight PGE2 on my head. So I think as far as like the PGE2 context of whatever potential like grand scheme theory of all this stuff is, I think castor oil is like the most tolerable, cost effective growth agonist that could be implemented out of everything in terms of the PGE2 factor of the equation. Now, at the end of the day, this all still stems back to androgens causing this whole cascade of events. And it can all, the whole process can be mitigated just by addressing the DHT and the testosterone at the beginning. But obviously, you know, for people that aren't willing to manipulate their hormone profile or aren't willing to, you know, implement certain things that they see as like too experimental, things like castor oil and things like, uh, you know, other, um, you know, more, like I would call it mainstream. Like it's like widely available on Amazon. It's like, you know, people do it already just for, you know, laxative and inducing labor. It's not like it's some like obscure, like unknown chemical that you're experimenting with here. Um, so as far as like things that are in the sort of mainstream, I guess it's probably like, you know, it has, seems to have a favorable risk profile and with a good effect. So it's definitely worth considering regardless if you're, you know, if, especially if you're not willing to like tackle the androgen part of the equation or, you know, like throw an experimental chemical into the middle of the cascade of events to kind of like halt the eventual hypoxia of the hair follicle or whatever it is that's occurring at the end of the cascade. Things like PG2 are going to put you in the right direction. In my opinion, things that endogenously increase it via natural means and it's actually regulated by your body as opposed to just shoving some predetermined arbitrary amount onto your head that your body actually can't regulate and like give a certain amount that it actually needs. That's the other reason I like the castor oil idea more than the PG2 is your body converts a certain amount of ricinoleic acid and then increases your PGE2 production as a consequent result of that ricinoleic acid as opposed to the PGE2. It's like, it's not a precursor. It's the literal final thing. So you can't, your body can't regulate how much it's being administered. You're literally shoving a mega dose on your head. So at least with the castor oil, there's at least some opportunity for your body to regulate how much you're getting because excess amounts of pg2 i surmise is not a good thing necessarily either like while a favorable ratio is ideal for aga outcomes i don't think that like shoving mega doses into your body at once is going to be a healthy long-term sustainable practice either so you know in that regard i think castor oil just edges out literal pge2 powder in like all regards and that's probably as far as I'm going to go with like statements on its efficacy because I'm just going to compare it to what it actually makes sense to compare it to. So, you know, things like literal PG2, I think it's definitely better than. You can't compare it to things like, oh, is this better than finasteride or, or dutasteride or RU or other, you know, like PGD2 inhibitors because it's a totally different mechanism of action. So consider, just keep that in mind. Like the ultimate, at the end of the day, your protocol should be something that ultimately addresses all factors or just addresses something early enough in the cascade that's like so sufficiently addressed that nothing else matters. But, you know, comparing a PGE2 agonist to something that's like an anti-androgen, you're not going to be able to compare the two because there's it's two different mechanisms of action and two different goals at the end of the day. But anyways, I'm kind of rambling right now. Hopefully you guys found that insightful. That's my update. I think it's working to whatever extent. I think it's definitely improving my growth rate density maybe a little bit i don't think it's like night and day difference in terms of what's going on here but i think it's definitely noticeable which is more than you can say for 90 percent of stuff out there especially for stuff that's high tolerability cheap over the counter 
all that kind of stuff. There's very few things that are going to give you that kind of result for like pennies on the dollar. So anyways, thank you guys for watching. Please like, subscribe, check out my blog, moreplatesmoredates.com, especially subscribe to the newsletter if you guys want to get an email automatically every time I publish an article. These videos, as you've seen, I kind of just talk on the fly. It can get pretty unorganized where I kind of just like ramble about my thoughts at the time, which can be good, but also at the same time, I'd like to have like a professional broken down concise statement sometimes, which is where the articles come into play, where it's broken down with table of content, concise subsections, and most importantly, when I reference a clinical study or a trial, or I make reference to something really important, there's actually a link that you can click on to go delve into it further yourself in the article as opposed to in the video. You know, there's no links to what I'm talking about when I reference something, it's just me talking. So anyways, a lot of incentive to sign up to the newsletter. You get notified as soon as these articles go live, get sent right to you. Yeah, if you want access to that content, highly recommend you subscribe in that link below. So thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.